Uh, this total destruction, everything we've grown up with and lived with our family with was gone. All the old houses that were along the beach, they were all gone. But now there's just nothing, still, even after two years. I'm meteorologist Dr. Bill Williams at the University of South Alabama. The year 2005 was the most active hurricane season on record. During that year, 27 named storms roamed the Atlantic Basin with several major hurricanes reaching the Gulf of Mexico. One of those storms was Hurricane Katrina, the most destructive hurricane in U.S. history. On August 29, 2005, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama experienced a day that will never be forgotten. Without question, Katrina left an unprecedented legacy of destruction. However, in the months following Katrina, valid questions remained about the causes of the massive path of damage that stretched from coastal Louisiana to New Orleans, then eastward for more than 120 miles across the Mississippi and Alabama coasts. Even after moving inland, Katrina's winds produced severe damage as far as 200 miles to the north. Why was the storm so bad? Several prior storm assessments have said the winds were not extreme as Katrina came ashore. If that were the case, then why did Katrina produce Category 5-like damage over such a large area? The Coastal Weather Research Center, working with scientists from the University of Wisconsin and Mississippi State University, has conducted an extensive analysis that answers these questions. Through post-storm research, aided by the use of microwave satellite technology, we now understand why Katrina was so massive and destructive. This research shows clearly that Katrina pounded the Gulf Coast for many hours with hurricane force winds before the storm surge came ashore. Several factors came together to produce this wide path of destructive winds, as well as the ensuing storm surge. These factors included the track of the storm over the warm waters of the Gulf Loop Current, the shape of the coastline, and the violent winds circulating around Katrina. Together they combined to create an extraordinary environment for a record-breaking hurricane. The result was a monster storm with a double eye wall with extended periods of northeasterly and easterly winds, collapsing cores that forced strong winds to the ground, and numerous tornadoes and other rotational wind events. Prior to this research, almost all of the post-storm wind analyses of Hurricane Katrina fail to take into account the existence of collapsing cores and the many types of rotational winds. As a result, wind speed maximums on the Mississippi coast were shown to be far less than what actually occurred. Let's revisit the Mississippi Gulf Coast for a detailed discussion of what science has revealed about Katrina. Despite Katrina's legacy of destruction, Katrina did not have the classic track of the great storms. Instead of forming off the African coast and taking a long curving sweep across the Atlantic, Katrina formed over the Bahamas just east of the Florida Peninsula on August 20th. Then two days later, it became a named storm when a cluster of thunderstorms rapidly organized. The storm intensified into a hurricane on August 24th as it approached Florida's east coast. The next day, Katrina made landfall as a Category 1 storm on the Saffir-Simpson scale. However, high pressure along the east coast of the United States forced the storm to the southwest. This took the center of Katrina through the Everglades where it maintained its structure over the flat wetlands. Upon reaching the Gulf of Mexico on August 26, Katrina steadily strengthened. But that was nothing compared to what happened when Katrina reached the central gulf and began her recurve to the north. Here, conditions were highly conducive, resulting in the explosive development of Katrina into a major hurricane. As it approached the Gulf Coast, Katrina lost some strength due to wind shear and reached the Louisiana coast on August 29th as a Category 3 hurricane. Rarely has the Gulf of Mexico exhibited such a favorable environment for a major hurricane as it did on August 28, 2005. As Hurricane Katrina moved into the southeast Gulf of Mexico, 
upper air winds over the central gulf fell practically calm with just a light outflow from the region as indicated by the arrows in this satellite photograph. This was an ideal situation for Katrina since brisk upper air winds would have been hostile to the storm. When the upper air winds are strong, such as shown in this satellite photo of Hurricane Florence in 2006, the top of the hurricane is sheared. This disrupts the entire system, throws it out of balance, and results in a weakening or complete dissipation of the storm. On August 28, 2005, a near zero wind shear environment existed over the central gulf. This light wind environment, now directly in the path of the storm, favored rapid intensification. To add to this, the central gulf was exceptionally warm thanks to the presence of the gulf loop current shown in red in this illustration. This river of warm water is a normal feature of the gulf. Now watch as we view the gulf loop current over the first eight months of 2005. Whereas the water over most of the gulf was warm during the summer of 2005, it was warm only to a shallow depth. However, in the gulf loop current, it was warm with considerable depth. When a hurricane crosses the loop current, the churning of the sea surface fails to bring colder water to the surface. Any hurricane crossing this area would be like crossing warm bath water. Katrina was one such storm. Katrina reached the central gulf on August 28th. In this illustration, note the increase in wind velocity as Katrina reached the loop current and then turned north around a high pressure system over the east coast. The near perfect conditions over the central gulf resulted in Katrina's explosive development into a category five hurricane. A hurricane with sustained winds now exceeding 170 miles per hour. Now let's get on board the Hurricane Hunter P3 research plane and see what Katrina's eye looked like when the storm was a Category 5 on August 28th. Although the eye of Katrina is clear above, numerous low-level clouds can be seen circulating around the interior of the eye below. Notice the dramatic stadium effect in the eye wall, a characteristic of an intense, well-developed hurricane. With Katrina reaching a Category 5 and displaying great symmetry, the storm was now building and pushing an enormous amount of Gulf water northward under the eastern semicircle of the storm. Katrina first reached the Gulf Coast at the Mississippi Pass in extreme southeast Louisiana. At that time, the maximum winds in the eye wall had dropped to a Category 3 hurricane. Importantly, the eye of the hurricane moved north across the marshlands of Plaquemines Parish, leaving the stronger eastern half of the hurricane over the open waters of the Gulf south of the Mississippi coast. In this illustration, the arrows represent Gulf waters being forced northward in the direction of the Mississippi coast and onto the continental shelf. To complicate matters, the Louisiana-Mississippi coast forms a natural concave shape with Louisiana on the west side and Mississippi on the north. 